Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference, brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor, Four Paws International. Before we start, we have a few basic housekeeping items. If you are joining us to see how a small farm made the decision to evacuate, you just missed them and the adorable goats, unfortunately. We had some technical difficulties, so we flipped our speakers and you will be hearing from Dr. Ian Dacre very shortly. We want to bring to your attention an important update regarding the conference schedule. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, F and H, on the original schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org for the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled. We encourage you to put questions in the Q&A box. This year, we've enabled multilingual closed captioning. So if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in your posts on social media to help spread the word about the conference. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit the presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GADMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be made available later this year once it has been properly edited. And now it is our privilege to have with us today, Dr. Ian Dacre, who will share his personal perspective on working for the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, of the United Nations Emergency Management Center. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Um, uh, can you hear me okay? I just want to check in with, with our technical issues that we had before, that everything's okay? We can hear you. You can see in here? Great. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and, and many thanks to Cindy and Jeffrey uh, for, for stepping in for me. It was a, a technical issue on, on my end uh, that my laptop was fried. And despite having two laptops, they were both out of order. And we were thinking about how we're going to run the presentation on a previously sent version on a PDF with me speaking through WhatsApp. I think all of this is just a perfect example as to what you have to do for disaster management, for emergency management. Um, you know, you've got to think outside the box. You can't expect things to run smoothly at any particular time. And, um, you know, and another thing, you know, having people that uh, relationships in place from sometimes years before, uh, knowing that I can get on the, the phone to Mel or Gerardo or others, and, and they know that they know me, having those relationships in place before you even start is essential. Uh, so, so, you know, I just encourage everyone to just continue building their networks uh, in whichever way they want. Um, I, I yeah, I'll, I'll move on to the first slide because this is kind of when I say building a network, this, this is my network, um, how I've got to where I am currently. And it's uh, it's a progress. Um, people sort of say, you know, why, how are you working for the United Nations um, now living in Rome as a vet from New Zealand? It's a bit of a long step sometimes for, for people to think. But in actual fact, it, it's a progression. And, you know, I think these things that you see on the screen there kind of illustrate the way that that, that it is a, a progression. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but I think all of us that work, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Gerardo's uh, sunny, smiling face on, on, on the screen here. Um, we've, we've known each other and worked together for many years and uh you know there's, there's some great people colleagues that work in this field and i'm privileged to um be still working with you all um 
I think I should just chuck up this little bit. This was uh, Susan from her presentation yesterday, just saying that, yeah, I am, today I'm actually speaking on my own behalf, even though I do work with the FAO. Um, but these are just some some of my own personal perspectives about what it's like to work in a one of the larger um, global emergency management units in, um, that we have. Um, people often ask me, what is the FAO? Um, it's the F Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And it, it was set up on the 16th of October, 1945 an easy date for me to remember. It's my mother's birthday, um, but that's her cackling way in the background. I'm actually on holiday back in New Zealand at the moment. Um, and it, it's made up of 195 members, 194 countries and the European Union, which as you know, is multiple countries. Um, but just like all UN agencies, it's, it's one member, one vote. So it doesn't matter if you're from Vanuatu or from uh, the USA. It's one member, one vote, and that, that's the way that, that it works. Um, headquarters are in Rome. That's where I work nowadays. Uh, it's, yeah, roughly we have operations in about 130 countries, and I don't have the latest number, on, but yeah, about 11,500 people working un under this structure, uh, a third of which are at um, at headquarters. And that, that's that picture you can see up in the top right uh, there. The one just to the left of it is the, the flag room where um, you will all have your countries represented. Um, I work there in, in the emergency management center. And um, sorry, I'll just mute myself while I just t t talk to some people in the background about their, uh, okay. But um, yeah, and I, I work for, with the EMC. And it's it was originally set up um, on the response to avian influenza. Uh, everyone was worried about how we were going to have the influenza virus creating another Spanish flu pandemic, and that is still a major concern. It, it's still uh, the those of us you know having enjoyed. A couple of years of COVID, uh, we we know that influenza, when it next jumps again, it will be much more serious than COVID was, uh, and that and that's why we're concerned about it, and that's why it's uh, it's a it's an issue for us all at the moment. Um, it's a complex organisation. Um, it's death by acronyms, so I'm not even really going to bother to try and go through them. And um, if if I can, I, sorry, I'll just if I can, I'll just mute myself for one second. Sorry about that. Just uh, living in the. It's, it's great being back home with the family, but sometimes they're they're a bit noisy. I didn't want you get any uh, extra crossfeed. Um, so. You know, we, we have structures such as the Chief Veterinary Officer, Keith Sumption. Uh, we have our Office for Emergency Response. The Emergency Management Center crosses, bridges both of these um, structures. And so, although I joined as a vet um, and I've been focusing on livestock emergency response, uh, we're also looking at plant emergencies, uh, bearing in mind the uh, capacity that, that plants actually feed uh, so much of the world. Fisheries is actually one of the largest organizations or units within the FAO. And so we're looking at how they manage fisheries emergencies, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of a, a, a quite, yeah, quite a complex structure and even understanding not for those of you that, you know, you, we talk about UNISDR or UNDRR, uh, et cetera, um, FAO is just one organization with, with sister organizations with the World Food Program. And one of our main concerns is making sure that people have food to eat. 
uh, be that plant or animal based. Um, coming into a bit more local territory of, of where I work, um, in the emergency management center, we have what we call four pillars. Uh, I think all of the people on this call, you know that the, the best bang for your buck is in preparedness, uh, you know, training people to do a better job and uh, having communities aware as to how they respond. I think the previous presentation um, from, from Cindy and Jeffrey uh, highlighted that very well. Um, what I work in is pillar two response. I'm the global response coordinator and you'll see a slide on that shortly. Um, then pillar three is around how we do coordination and it's uh, the other organizations that we, we talk to, liaise with, so that we know that we're all on the same page. Um, and then pillar four is around um, just making sure we have the resources to support these various activities. And uh, yeah, so pillar one, uh, and a, a good colleague, friend of ours, um, Suzanne Munsterman heads this up, and they do various things. One of them, an easy one to say is uh, GIMP, the um, Good Emergency Management Practice. It's now in its just soon to be third edition coming out. Um, and it's basically just looking at how we do um, emergency preparedness. It's a, it's a training module, it's available online. Anyone can sign up to this uh, and, and run through the course. It's been uh, you know, over, I think the first version was 2011, 2012. Um, but it's uh, just going through all of the things that everyone that's been attending this conference already knows about how you're doing contingency plans, how you do preparedness, how you do planning, etc. So I, I, I won't really go too much into the, the details of it, but you know that, um, you know, when we're looking at the epidemiology of an animal health event, there's a bit of a curve uh, as to when it it happens, you know, we'd like to think that we're in peacetime all the time, but globally, in reality, we never are. Uh, if I said at the moment, how many outbreaks of avian influenza are going on currently, uh, it would be in the hundreds, if not thousands around the world. So there's always something happening somewhere. Uh, we, we like to think that we might be in our own little bit of personal peacetime, but globally, that, that just doesn't exist. Um, so we're always looking at the alert and the emergency um, phases and then looking at how, if and when an area has been impacted by an animal health uh, event, we, we reconstruct to build back better. Um, the GIMP, the Good Emergency Management Practices Toolkit is quite useful. It, like I say, it's available online free through the FAO website. Um, there's various manuals that have been done. There's, um, there's, there's tools such as how to do after action reviews, or it's, it even goes into um, preparation for bio threats, bioterrorism, adverse events that are planned rather than just happen as, as natural disasters can. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about the, the PEP, the Progressive Pathway for Emergency Preparedness. Um, we've done a lot of training on, on GIMP principles around the world. Uh, the slide shows it all. It's, um, it's a fairly well-known tool. Any of you that are joining us today uh, that aren't familiar with, I'd encourage you to have, have a little look for it. It's quite useful. And um, the, the whole idea is that these workshops are to improve capacity building, getting governments, and, and I should say that the FAO um, usually works with the National Veterinary Services as a local collaborator um, or national co collaborator when we're running these workshops, either regionally or nationally, depending on the, the need. Um, outside of that, just a quick little bit about PEP, which is a more recent tool. It's only been around for 
um, four or five years. And it's uh, the emergency preparedness pathway, and it's getting countries to do a snapshot as to how they see themselves uh, being able to respond to an emergency for animal health uh, emergency events. It's, it's really taken off quite well. Um, we get them to do the assessment in peacetime. Um, these terms of peacetime, alert, emergency and reconstruction are all part of the, the GIMP training. And so we, we get them to do an assessment. It, it covers these four general areas of principles, preparation, prevention and detection. Um, and that's initially as it was for animal health emergency disease outbreaks, but it's, a, it's actually quite useful. I've used it for, um, for example, for preparing for volcanic eruption uh, preparedness. How, how can a, a, a local province, um, I'm here, I'm thinking particularly of Philippines, Indonesia, if they've got a volcanic event uh, how prepared are they to, to deal with that situation? So it's, it's quite a, a useful tool. Um, and then you'll go through with the local authorities, the national authorities to determine how they view themselves as being either in a state of one, two, three or four. Um, and it, it really is, it's, it's as much a tool for them to use it to identify to their central government to improve their own funding assets that they may have for it. I, I don't have time today to go through all the details of it, um, but suffice to say, if you're an emergency management person, it's really quite intuitive. And it's a bit like, I think I saw um, um, Erica Honey's presentation yesterday. If you want to go somewhere fast, you go it alone. If you want to go there in a, in a sustainable way, take people with you. And I would say it's the same thing for doing a, a PEP assessment. If you want people to make it a sustainable um, process, you you make sure that you bring in as many stakeholders as you can with you in the in the process. Um, okay, so whether they're vets, farmers, industry, etc. Um, but if you if you look to do this, it can it can actually happen. And then at the end of the day, you come up with a nice little spider graph showing you where you think, uh, you know, down around here, where you think your resources are best spent, because uh, they're always limited. We never get enough money for doing what we want to do. Um, but it helps you give that in a, in a more, um, you know, um, identifiable, precise way. Uh, we've done PEP assessments throughout quite a bit of the world already. Uh, there's still more ongoing. If any of you are interested in, in doing one, it's always um, the country coming and requesting us to help them do it. So wherever you are uh, joining this presentation, I uh, encourage you to send me an email, which you'll, you'll see at the end of this presentation. Um, and then just to sort of say that from the PEP, where we've basically the emergency management center was set up to respond to the fear of avian influenza and that becoming a, a large pandemic and which is still a big likelihood uh, but we are looking at it through using tools like pep through other um, areas such as aquatics natural disasters, locust infestations, et cetera, um, across the board. Um, and it's interesting, I think, you know, back in the days when uh, I was working with WISPA, the World Society for the Protection of Animals, um, with Harado and, and others, um, we looked at the disaster management cycle. And nowadays, whether it, in GIMP, we kind of look at it as, as phasing. We hope that we don't end up at exactly the same spot as we started in the cycle. So whether it's a spiral or a circle, um, we, we like to think that we're always improving the situation overall, um, even though things like climate change are 
um, against us. Uh, we hope that some of our um, use of resources are, are becoming more efficient, more effective. This is what I do. Um, I'm the global response coordinator for animal health um, when I when I show up at my desk in Rome. And it can be pretty much anything from um, we've got the new foot and mouth strains um, spreading throughout the Middle East, Near East at the moment. So we identified a team of experts to go out there and help their the um, Iraq uh, veterinary services determine how, if they could control the new SAT2 virus strain from spreading versus a couple of months before, for example, we sent a team off to Mauritania to um, again work with the government veterinary services for how they had uh, a resurgence of Rift Valley fever in their country which is a zoonotic disease. And so how, how that's the slide on the left or the picture on the left over there, um, how, how they could respond in a more sustainable way to that. Um, we've done a lot of response um, around the world. As you can see, um, yeah, it's over a hundred responses in 50 countries or more. Um, but it's, a, it's, it's at the invitation of the government. We don't go where we're not welcome. We, as, as I think is the case for any organization, it, it only is, it's, it, it's in, only in your best interest to go where you're wanted and where you're actually being requested to be. Um, so, you know, I've, I've seen other organizations arrive thinking they're, trying to show up and help. And in fact, they haven't had, for example, people that speak the local language. And so suddenly they're a drain on, on resources for translation rather than a, a benefit for that country. So just um, make sure that you're always uh, aware of these sorts of things. Um, we're doing uh, we, we track our missions, we make sure that we deliver what we say we will. We've got around about 30 odd standard operating procedures, SOPs, uh, whether it's under alert planning, deployment or post mission. And we, we always try to do our lessons learned after we've gone somewhere. Uh, as we know, doing a response is, is never perfect and you can always learn from the what you what you tried to do and try and make it better the next time. So doing after action reviews is is really quite critical, and then training people that are involved in it to make sure that they can do that. Um, then, yeah, I won't really go on about SOPs. I'm just watching the clock, uh, but we do we do like to monitor a lot of everything that's going on. Um, we've got a team of about roughly 25 of us in headquarters focusing on different areas, whether it's working with WOA, our partner, the World Animal Health Organization, who also have an active disaster management program, whether it's um, working with people who are training on legs, livestock emergency guidelines and, stack and standards, uh, these sorts of things. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we monitor um, on a day-to-day -day basis, um, which leads us into pillar three, um, doing incident coordination. I think we've had that in several talks already, just how important it is to make sure that everyone's on the same page. An organization as large as the FAO, we first of all need to make sure that we are all talking and communicating as within ourselves, within our own units and groups, um, whether it's the Emergency Center for Transboundary Animal Diseases, or whether it's EMC with our team, or whether it's IMPRESS, which is about emergency management prevention, um, making sure that we're all aware of what we're doing. And so these are just a few of the organizations that we may work with. You'll see, for example, even Interpol in there, that's where we 
have to be aware that sometimes animal health events are deliberate, not um, just natural. And so um, we've got a, another program of work around that. Um, but yeah, these are all, it, it, it's critical to be effective to make sure that we're, we're working as a, as a team together in our emergency management. Um, we've had various ICGs. I had the dubious pleasure of being the chair of the COVID um, incident coordination group uh, when we were basically just making sure that organizations, other organizations knew what extent animals were or were not being implicated in it. And it's, that's another that's another story. And I think I gave a little bit of a talk on that uh, at the last uh, conference a couple of years ago on the implications that uh, COVID had on animal production systems and animal supply chains, et cetera. Um, yeah, so whether it's uh, foot and mouth disease, highly pathogenic avian influenza, um, lumpy skin disease, or again, FMD, uh, we, we do run these uh, coordination group meetings um, fairly often. So we've got loads of publications. I mean, it's almost information overload. So I'm going to keep this short. I know time's just about out. Um, but this is the, I just encourage you to go to the FAO website. Um, I, I think generally it's an organization. If I talk about UN agencies, most people have heard of UNICEF or the World Food Program or you know various other ones. Um, FAO is the only one that actually has a, a animal focus with a chief veterinary officer and, uh, and a lot of animal health programs of work. So we like, we like working with partners, um, and always happy to hear from you. So, uh, this is, this is us, uh, there's a few of us there. This this is this is a uh, actually the the just the, the tip of the team. Um, there's there's quite a few more of us globally, but uh, like I say, most of our work is done through our partnerships and and the the, the uh, offices that we have in the regions and in the countries themselves. So I think that's about it. Um, should I can I pass this back to the chair if if we've got time for questions? Have I? I'm hoping that the IT has worked and that you've actually been able to hear everything uh, that I've we been have. talking about. We've heard everything and, and I think we might have one question um, coming. I know we did have one, so we'll see if it, it pops up, but thank you so much for joining us and what an amazing organization. And Jean, can I make it uh, on the mic? I can't type it for some reason. We can hear you, Gerardo. Go for it. Sure. Uh, doctor, uh, I know that um, FAO has been busy working on the intersection of climate change and um, disasters. What can you tell us about that, that work? Ooh. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big, big bit of work um there i mean the impact of climate change is huge there's whole departments uh which are separate from the emc the emergency management center that that are looking at this um yesterday i put into the chat um about 2040 and 2040 is a year that if you Google it and look for some papers, you'll see how climate change and its impact on societies and just generally the way things are going, it's it's a it's almost like a target year to be a bit concerned about. Um, we, how can I say it? I mean, I, you know, I, I think everyone that's that's joining this this meeting today, we're all fully aware that you know climate change is having a huge impact on agriculture, on systems, on populations, people, etc. Um, there were some big announcements out of the U.S. just the other day about how they're finally trying to come back on board to uh, 
join join the the movement to slow down carbon emissions, etc. Um, to think that we're going to be not reaching the 1.5 degree increase now is is unlikely, unfortunately, and that's going to impact on um, you know global water levels. It's going to impact on um, hydrometeorological events, which will in, increase. Uh, we will have more fires. We will have more floods. Um, and I think this was my question that I was asking yesterday to to members is just how do how do we all um, plan for this? Because we have to plan for it. Uh, if if we don't, we're just being an ostrich and sticking our head in the sand. So let's just take it on as a reality and uh, see you know what what uh for those of you that are joining this discussion today what's your plan for five years for 10 years for 20 years because we need to be framing it like that and saying right okay between here and 2040 what can we do you know what can you as an individual do what can your organization do and put some some markers in the sand uh, we we under the FAO work under the sustainable development goals. Um, you know, one of our main objectives is to try and make sure that people have enough food on their plate. Um, that's, you know, that's a good, you know, I think that's SDG number two. Um, but there's an awful lot of other stuff. If you look at the other SDGs as to improving education, improving equality, improving so many other areas. So um, yeah, I just encourage everyone to um, keep act act local as as we heard from the previous uh, presentation from from Cindy and Jeffrey. Act local but think global. And I think we do all have to have a global hat on as well when we're doing our day-to-day -day, uh, business, business as usual. Thanks, Harado. I'm not sure if I that completely answered the question, but um, gave, gave, gave me an opportunity to put a bit of that stuff and out there. You certainly gave us quite, quite a lot to think about. We do have one guest asking a question for those of you who have joined us. Um, we are wrapping up. Thank you, Dr. Digger, so much for taking the time to join us. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the holiday with your family. 